Welcome to episode 216 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer-director Michael Radford. He just did a film called The Music of Silence, which is a biopic on the singer Andre Bocelli. So stay tuned for that interview. Towards the end of the podcast, I'm going to try out a new section where I answer listener questions. And today's questions are, what is a screenplay treatment? What's the difference between a treatment and a synopsis? And how long should a screenplay treatment be? So stay tuned for the answers to those questions. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 216. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing writer-director Michael Radford. Here is the interview. Welcome, Michael, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a big pleasure. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? I had no interest in the entertainment business for a long time. I mean, I, I was um, I was son of a uh, of a military family. Uh, I was born in India. I grew up in Africa, in Libya, um, and um, I ended up uh, after I went to university. I went to Oxford University, where I studied politics, philosophy, and economics, which has nothing to do with the movie business either. And then I wanted to be an actor for a moment or two, and I went up to Scotland, and that didn't work. And I left that and uh, uh, ended up. Uh, um, teaching uh, in a very rough school um, in the in the back streets of Edinburgh, and um, in order to somehow uh, entertain the kids that I was working with, who were only about two years younger than I was, um, I, I, I found this little film camera, a little Bolex 16 millimeter. A movie camera that the school had bought and nobody used, and I and I thought, hell, it would be great to make a film with these guys, <laughs> just uh-huh. keep them quiet. I'd never done it before. I I just kind of pointed the camera at them, and an extraordinary thing happened to me. I I just and and I really this is true. Um, like in a way, St. Paul on the on 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 the on the road to Damascus, I I I was hit by this sudden understanding that I. I this language worked I, I didn't it's like it's like a musician you know when when I'm not a musician but I'm told that you know when guys who are or people who are very very good musicians or, or very musically um, centered can look at a piano and just see the notes just see them mm-hmm. in the same way I, I found myself looking through a movie camera and realizing that there was a language here that I actually could speak and I can't really say more than that and I was just determined from that moment onwards to become a movie maker. And so what were some of those Forgot steps? Forgot the kids. <laughs> and so what were some mm. of those steps? Now you I, have this, you found this passion. What were some of those steps to actually turning it into a career? So what I did was I went to the, um, to the, National, Film, the National Film School, as it was then in the UK, which had just fa- been founded. Um, so I was in the group of the first, um, I don't know, uh, 12 or 15... 25, 25 students that we were to begin with. Mm -hmm. I came out of there uh, after a couple of years, and really there was no film industry in England at that time. I started making documentaries. Hmm. And then I went to, um, and I made a couple of documentaries in Italy and got kind of interested in it. Then I went to Scotland to work for the BBC, um, 
theoretically making documentaries for the arts programs. But I, had somebody asked me to write a document, to write a, to do make a documentary about um, a writer, and I said, look, she was a wonderful Scottish writer, and 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 I said, look, why don't why don't I make a film about how people turn their uh, life experience into fiction? Uh, and they said, yeah, that's a really great idea. So okay, you've got ten minutes of f- fiction to put in this movie, and the rest is going to be a seventy-minute uh, uh, interview with this woman. Mm-hmm. It's called Jessie Kesson. Huh. And I sat down. I found her first novel. I wrote a screenplay, took it back to them and said, look, I've written a 70-minute screenplay, and I thought that I'd add 10 minutes of interview to this. <laughs> and that broke me. I got, I, got, I, got into, I got to make a feature film for television, huh. which was extremely successful. And then, I, and then very quickly, uh, I, made a, I made another one with her, called Another Time, Another Place, about three Italian prisoners of war in the north of Scotland. And that went to the Cannes Film Festival and uh, in the director's fortnight, uh, not expecting anything. I suddenly, it was suddenly a huge hit in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, I had Cahiers du Cinéma uh, voting it the best film of the year. I had Jean-Luc Godard writing me a, a note saying that, that he was... Um, doing a documentary about how the British couldn't make movies, and he'd seen my film, and he cancelled the documentary. I don't believe a word of it, but he did. <laughs> That's what he said. And Bernardo Bertolucci um, sent, uh, called me from Italy. I didn't know, didn't know any of these people from Adam, and said, look, you know, you know, understand Italian. You understand Italians better than anybody I've ever met from uh, from abroad. I said, I don't know why. And he said, and he said, okay, well, you should be making films. With... And finally... This, I, you know, I was trying to, I, I made, I, and then I went off and did a whole different other, you know, I, I, my producer and I took a punt and, and got, bought the rights to, to um, 1984 and made that. And that was a huge movie and that was my second movie. Okay. And, um, and then I made a film called White Mischief, which was um, um, even bigger, or not even bigger, but, but fun and in Africa mm-hmm. and all the rest of it, but wasn't a big uh, commercial success so I was casting about and this um, Italian actor called me up and he said um, it, 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 this guy Massimo Teresi and said look uh, you know why don't we make a film together and I said w- why, why should we and he said he said because another time another place is my favorite movie of all time and I and I, w- I want to work with you so we cooked up this thing together he didn't speak any English and I didn't at that moment speak very much Italian but we cooked up this, we found this um, Chilean novel, which uh, very few people had read. And, um, and that was it. <laughs> it took off. It really took off. Who, who, who would have thought that that movie, you know, would outgross Die Hard 2, which uh-huh. it did. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, great um, story. Let's, let's jump into your most recent film, The Music of Silence. Maybe you can kind of tell us what that's all about, if you have a pitch or log line for it. I don't, it's it's about it's it's about the life of uh, or the, the the biopic about Andrea Bocelli, um, and the singer, the opera singer. Mm-hmm. Perfect. And how did and, you? Um, how did I get involved in it? Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, is that what is that yeah, what you I was meant? Just ask yeah, you, I got involved in it. Well, because I'm 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 famous in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I, in all these Italian things that I've done. Uh, you know, people do, you know, I get tables in restaurants and stuff and, and people take selfies with me in the street and stuff. Huh. And uh, so this, and so I get kind of a lot of offers from there. Usually I don't do them because, you know, I, I know much less about Italy than people think I do. Uh-huh. Um, but I, but, but um, this was from a friend of mine called Roberto Sesso, who's a producer. And um, he, he, um, I turned him down on several occasions. I said, I, I can't make a biopic of somebody who's still alive you know it's going to be terrible he's just going to be saying things like it wasn't like that and you know mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff but um he persuaded me to do it so so um and he 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 accepted that anna pavignano uh, who i wrote in Postino with would would write it and okay. um and we also wrote she also wrote a film elsa and fred that, that, that i did as well so so we ended up um I ended up doing it, and I and and um, in a way, it wasn't a film that I'd 
chosen to do. It was a film that kind of chose me. And I thought, why not? You know, the, you know, people, people are desperate to make pictures, and it's it's rare that you know it, it happens. And and I thought, you know, it'd be it would just. I'd love to do this. I'd love to just try this out. Yes. Um, how do you? And I had you... several constrictions. Yeah, so let's talk about how you approach Carry something on. like this. Um, did you did you go and talk to um, talk to him about his life and take notes? Did he have like an autobiography that you read? How do you even approach a life story like this of someone that's famous? Well, he had an autobiography which he which he and and the producer had, had written had had taken the rights and um, it it isn't by any means an adaptation of that autobiography. But it did give me enough facts about his life mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for Anna and I to sit down and construct a, a, scre a screenplay. Yeah. Um, and um, it was, um, you know, uh, there were certain things that, that they wanted from it. And, and, and I felt kind of, I felt kind of very free because I, I wasn't sitting down and torturing myself to find something that comes from my innermost soul. It was just making a film about somebody that I found really interesting, I have yeah. to say. And, and he'd written those, this autobiography. What are some of those things? You mm. just mentioned the producers had a few things that they wanted in the um, film. I wonder if you can talk about some of those sort of specific things that they definitely wanted. I think that, well, they wanted a lot of music, that's for mm. sure. Yeah. Um, and I think that really um, what what we came to an agreement over was that we would make it about how he made it, basically, how this little blind kid from a little village in Tuscany made it, a guy twice blinded, if you like, um, uh, made it, and, and, and the kind of force of character that it took um, to get that far. Um, and... and um, of course, in his biography, there was in his autobiography, there are details of stuff that you know you just you know so much detail that you can't possibly take it all in, and you have to just mm -hmm. select a path through it if you like. And that was probably the most difficult thing to do. Um, and I, we just decided that um, we would take it to the moment that where he'd. I mean, if you imagine this, he waited nearly ten years to appear on stage, having been promised something um, 10 years before. Um, and, uh, but he walked out on stage, and from that moment, he was, he was a hit. Yeah. And, um, let's talk, and that let's was talk it. And, and then, th mm, tell me. I'm sorry, let's, I just don't mean to cut you off. Um, let's talk about collaboration. I have a lot of listeners to the podcast that they write with a partner. Maybe you can just describe how your partnership with Anna goes. Are you guys in the same room when you're writing? Do you outline, divide up scenes, and then she writes some scenes, you write some things? Maybe just describe just sort of the, 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 sort of the logistics of all of that. Well, working with Anna is, um, is fairly unique, actually, uh, from other people that I've, that I've worked with. First of all, she doesn't speak any English. Okay. Uh, so we, we communicate in Italian, uh, even though we're, we're supposedly writing in English. Yeah. <laughs> it's really complicated. Um, she, uh, with Anna, it, she's very much a screenwriter, um, not a director or anything like that. So she will do um, a first draft, and then I'll do a second draft. Mm -hmm. that's basically how it works. And then we'll kind of collaborate and argue and, and have a get our final draft. So that's basically how it works. Um, and, and, and she, uh, on this picture, did most of the work, to be honest, okay. um, because it is an Italian picture. But, but um, normally when I work with someone, I work on my, I, when I say I work with somebody, I work on my own normally. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do do um, is I hire somebody um, to, and, and, and uh, right at this moment, it's my wife, actually. <laughs> it was the first time she's done it. But I will hire somebody as a kind of um, what I would call a sounding board because I find that I write much better um, if, I'm, if I talk it, if I, if I invent it talking. I see. Huh. And I think a lot of writers, a lot of writers or directors who write work that way it isn't always the case yeah. um I've, I've written scripts i've written scripts completely on my own but it takes longer and you have more doubt and i'm less full of ideas if i can 
verbalize my ideas, I can then, I don't need anybody to write them down or write them. I, 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 can, I know where I'm going. But just, just to sort of talk to somebody um, is, is a very, very uh, useful thing. And I think, that, uh, I think that's why, in a sense, you know, Right, script writers, script writers often work in pairs. Okay, sounds good. Um, I appreciate it, Michael. Good luck with this film and um, all your future films. I really appreciate your coming on and talking with me today. Thank you, Ashley. It's, it's really nice of you. Thank you. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website. And you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write a logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline synopsis service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of the SYS Select program. This is a new service, but we've already got producers in the system looking for screenplays. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter each month that we send out two producers to highlight the best scripts that have come through our system. It's another great way to get your material out there and in front of many, many producers. <clears throat> if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Just a quick shout out to screenwriter Stephen Hoover, who just who used the SYS email fax blast service a while back. He met a producer through the blast and optioned the script to him, so that's fantastic. Congratulations to Stephen. I added a little blurb to the SYS success page if you want to learn a little bit more about this option. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash success. In the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing writer Devon Shepard. He's a comedian and a screenwriter. He's written on a number of popular TV shows like Weeds, Mad TV, The Fresh Pinch of Bel Air, and many, many, many more. He's got dozens and dozens of TV credits. We have a wide ranging talk, but we spend a lot of time really digging into the early days of his career and how he broke into TV writing. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. To wrap up the show, I thought I would answer a few questions that have been sent in to me. If you have a question, you could always email me at info at sellingyourscreenplay.com, but just please check the sellingyourscreenplay.com frequently asked questions page first, because I would say maybe half the questions that I get emailed in, I've already answered on the FAQ page. So just check that out. I'll link to it in the show notes, but it's just sellingyourscreenplay.com slash FAQ. So this week's question is, and it's a series of questions, but they're all very much related, is the question is, what is a screenplay treatment? What's the difference between a treatment and a synopsis? How long should a screenplay treatment be? Okay, so let's take the first part of this. From my experience when someone, and when I say someone, I mean a producer or a director, asks a writer for a treatment, they are typically mean a fairly long version of the story written out in just normal prose with normal sentences and normal paragraphs. I would say in general as a guideline, eight to 12 pages is about right, but this is a very arbitrary number and I'm gonna get back to that in a minute. Here's the bigger point though, I'm not sure you really even need to write what I just described as a treatment if you're writing a spec script. I've never written a treatment unless it's for a writing assignment where you develop the treatment with the producer and they sign off on it before you actually start writing the screenplay. 
And this makes sense. It's easier to rewrite the treatment than it is to rewrite a finished screenplay. So it's much better to do a few drafts of the treatment before you start on the screenplay so that everyone involved, and that might be a producer, a director, you know, who knows, might be, might be an actor, but these, these group of people have hired you as a writer and part of your sort of deal with them is going to do maybe two or three passes of a treatment and then maybe two or three passes of a screenplay. So that's going to all be outlined in your contract. And again, this this is sort of the logical progression. You start out with maybe a shorter six page treatment, you flush it out a little bit more, but you want everybody to sign off on this because the worst thing that can happen is you hand in a screenplay and there's a bunch of things that weren't discussed beforehand and the producers and the director, they may not like what you've done and they may be like, well, this needs a, re a page one rewrite and you're back to square one. And again, it's easier to rewrite that treatment than it is to rewrite that finished screenplay. So if everybody signs off on that treatment before you start writing on the screenplay, it will hopefully avoid sort of a development hell as you get into the screenplay. So again, that's sort of the context as my own career as a screenwriter, that's the context of where I've written treatments. Now, if you're writing a spec script and writing a detailed treatment is part of your sort of own development process, that's totally fine. Go ahead, write a treatment. It's similar to outlining on the index cards. That's a very popular method screenwriters use. You put one scene on an index card, you lay it out in front of you. You can remove scenes, you can add scenes. And I find that, you know, in this day and age with something like Word, it's very easy to do basically the same kind of thing with a treatment where you just, each paragraph is its own scene and you can pull scenes out, you can drop scenes in, you can rewrite scenes. So again, if writing a treatment is sort of part of your process, that's totally fine. You know, go ahead and do it. And, and you might even have a treatment at the end of it that somebody might actually look at if they want to see that um, maybe before they read the script. And I'm going to talk about more of that in a minute. So back to the question on length for a minute. More than worrying about how long the treatment should be, it's really a matter of considering what the purpose of the treatment is. If it's the first step in a writing assignment, like what I mentioned earlier, you've got to make sure it's detailed enough to really flush out all the characters and story beats so that you avoid having to make a lot of those decisions when you're writing the actual screenplay. Because if you make those decisions later in the process, the producer may not like them. You want to avoid surprises when you turn in that first draft to the producer. So again, just in my own career, when I've been hired as a, as a writer, um, as a screenwriter to write up an idea from a producer, typically I think those treatments end up about 8 to 12 pages. Those are pretty detailed, and those are single-spaced treatments, single-spaced pages, obviously one-sided. So 8 to 12 pages, again, that's kind of where mine have fallen, but I would err on the side, if this is the position you're in where you're on a writing assignment, I would err on the side of being a little too long and making sure you're, you're thorough and detailed because, again, you want to avoid problems once you hand up surprises, you know, that, that the producer doesn't like when you hand in that first first draft. Obviously, if you're writing for yourself, it doesn't matter how long it is. Um, I can't remember who, but one of the guests on my podcast, his whole writing process was he starts out kind of just writing a loose treatment, and then he slowly just develops that treatment more and more and more until it literally becomes the screenplay. He'll start putting in dialogue. He'll start putting in, you know, more and more description. He'll start polishing it up. So he just starts with Word and just slowly just polishes this document until eventually it turns into a screenplay. Again, everybody's process is different. So if you're just asking about a treatment in that context, that's totally fine. It's, it's however you want it to work and it can be as long or short as you want in any format that you want. I do always write what I sort of call a short synopsis. I always write a one page single spaced probably roughly 400 word synopsis for each one of my spec scripts and that way if a producer asks for a synopsis or treatment before they'll read the whole screenplay that's I have that ready and that's what I send them that's usually enough to make them you know be willing to request the script or say no thanks it's not for me I'd say, you know, when, I, when I'm pitching scripts to producers, um, and this is probably a lot of like cold query letters, I would say maybe 10% of the, 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 the time, um, the script requests, these are positive responses. So 10% of the people who respond, 
say, could you send me a synopsis before you send me the whole script? Um, and that's what I do. So it's not, I would say, super common, but it's also not uncommon. Um, it happens enough that I feel like having that one page synopsis ready is, is helpful. Also, when you option a screenplay to a producer, they will often ask you for a short synopsis. And so it's good to have it at that point as well. They're going to create their own materials to pitch the project to investors. And most likely that's going to require, you know, again, half page or a one page synopsis. You're going to need something for the producer. And, um, you know, it's very helpful if you just have that ready to go. It's polished, it's complete. Um, and the producers will be very grateful that you have that. Also, with my own SYS Select screenplay database, part of the materials that you upload into the database is a short synopsis. So, you know, again, a one page synopsis is very handy there. And the other similar services out there that are similar to my screenplay database, they usually want a synopsis as well. So, having sort of that one page synopsis handy for those will allow you to get to use those services and have that stuff ready. So, that's kind of where I see a synopsis going. I, in terms of, you know, the different uses of the of the terms treatment versus synopsis, I think the words are pretty interchangeable. But again, I think it, 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 it seems to me like when someone says a treatment, you know, when someone, when a producer asks for a treatment, they are expecting something a little longer than a one page synopsis. Um, but sometimes that may be what they want, but sometimes that's what I give them. And that kind of leads me to my next point, which is you sometimes get kind of ridiculous requests from producers. For instance, you might send them the law, pitch in the log line. Oh, this sounds interesting. Do you have a synopsis? Then I send them the one page synopsis. Yeah, this sounds really good. Do you have a longer, a five page synopsis or a 10 page synopsis? And at that point, I will generally say, you know, no, this is all I have, but you know, would you like to read the screenplay? Sometimes the producers rarely, I would say maybe I can think of maybe one instance where the producer maybe got a little finicky and said, no, I, you have to send me a 10 page synopsis before I'm going to read the script. And then think in that case, I just said, okay, this isn't a good fit. And, and I didn't send them anything. Um, you can get into a loop of just, you know, every producer, oh, do you have a half page synopsis? Do you have a three page synopsis? Do you have the Blake Snyder beat sheet? And, you know, every producer might want something a little different. And I don't know that it's worth my time to curtail every submission specifically I'm going to go write you know a six page synopsis for this guy and then go write a 12 page synopsis for that guy it's like it just takes a lot of time to produce this material on the off chance that this guy reads it and likes it so that's kind of again what I do one page synopsis a log line obviously and then a one page synopsis and that's usually enough 99% um, of the time when a producer says could you send me a treatment I send him this one page synopsis and um, and that that suffices Okay, so taking a step back, a, a further step back, this sort of question to me, it just reveals a little bit of a lack of understanding of sort of the screenwriting business in general. And I'll, I'll explain that. Screenwriting is a lot less formal than most other forms of writing. So don't get too caught up in the formalities. You hear the advice given a lot, just write a great story. And I do think at least in this sort of context, that that's sort of correct. I mean, you don't want to do anything too crazy or too outlandish or too, you know, strange, but, you know, it's turning in a one page synopsis, like what I just described to a producer that was expecting a 10 page treatment, it's not going to be the end of the world. The producer is going to understand the situation. They're smart people and they're going to read that one page synopsis and, and hopefully they're going to decide whether this is something they want to read or not. Um, but again, don't get too caught up in the formalities. Um, you know, don't get too caught up on how long it should be or what's the difference between a synopsis and a treatment. Um, you can always ask the producer what exactly they're expecting if they if they ask you something that you don't understand. I mean, when you're pitching these producers, like they know what the game is. Like you don't have to pretend that you're like super experienced. I mean, they can look you up on IMDb. They probably have already done that if they've, you know, read your log line and are interested in taking it to the next level. They might have looked you up on IMDb, but they can probably tell from your pitch, your career or something that you're not like the super super most experienced writer. So just being like open and honest and transparent, if they ask you something about anything, synopsis treatment or anything that they, they may ask for, um, you know, a pitch deck or any, any terminology that they use that you don't understand, just, just be honest and say, you know, what exactly do you mean by this? And the producers know, um, you know, they know what the score is. They're not expecting you to know all of this stuff. So I don't think it's a big deal to ask them. But again, I also wouldn't get too caught up in, um, 
in just sort of the formalities and you know there's just not a there's, there's not a lot of formalities with screenwriting if you got final draft or some you know normal screenwriting program that's going to get your script pretty well formatted and um you know if someone asks for something that you don't understand just ask them and um or do your best submit what you think they're talking about and if it's not what they want they'll probably just ask you for for they'll give you more directions on what they do want so concentrate on making your writing clear and compelling and you'll be in good shape no matter how long it is or how it's formatted. Um, so that's really sort of my macro advice to these sorts of questions. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.